Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast about foreign policy and world affairs. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. And in this show, we discuss topical global issues, have conversations with foreign affairs thought leaders and newsmakers, and give you the context you need to understand the world today. Go to globaldispatchespodcast.com to learn more. And now on with the show. The Syrian war may be entering its final phase. Rebel fighters from various factions are now concentrated in Idlib in northern Syria. Idlib is the place to which civilians and members of armed groups were permitted to escape as part of evacuation deals from places like Aleppo and eastern Ghouta as they fell to government forces. Millions of displaced Syrians and some armed groups are now concentrated in Idlib. And now there is every indication that Syrian forces, backed by Russia, are preparing for battle. My guest today is trying to warn the world how disastrous such a battle would be for civilians caught in the crossfire. Jan Egeland is a senior advisor to the UN Special Envoy for Syria and heads the UN's Humanitarian Task Force for Syria. As such, it is his job to negotiate access to besieged populations for relief workers and facilitate humanitarian relief in Syria's war zones. A battle over Idlib, he says, would be a bloodbath that could jeopardize the lives of three million people. In our conversation, Jan Egeland describes the significance of Idlib to the trajectory of the war, the geopolitics undermining a potential decision by the Syrians to lay siege to it, and the potential fallout from such a battle. We also discuss what NGOs in Idlib are doing to prepare for such an attack. Jan Egeland is a longtime humanitarian professional. He is currently the head of the Norwegian Refugee Council and served as the top UN humanitarian relief official from 2003 to 2006. This meant he reported directly to Kofi Annan, so we kick off with a brief conversation about the late Secretary General's legacy before turning our discussion to Syria. Over three years ago, I had Jan Egeland on the podcast to discuss his life and career and how he became so compelled by global humanitarian issues. If you want to hear more from Jan Egeland, I suggest you go back and listen to that episode. It's as relevant now as it was back then. I'll post a link to it on globaldispatchespodcast.com. And as always, you can go to globaldispatchespodcast.com to visit our robust archives. That includes that episode with Jan Eaglen, plus many, many hundreds, hundreds of, of episodes at this point with foreign affairs thought leaders and luminaries, as well as conversations about topical issues in global affairs. And if you have suggestions of someone you would like me to interview, please send them my way. You can use the contact button on the homepage. And now here is my conversation with Jan Egeland. Uh, really, it was uh, unexpected uh, and, and, a, and a big blow uh, because I was among the many who worked directly with Kofi Annan. For many years, I admired him in so many ways. He helped me. He backed me. He was a very loyal boss when I was in the U.N., and he will be sorely missed. What, what do you suspect his most important, most lasting legacy will be? Well, I think he really uh, reestablished the UN as a moral uh, voice. Uh, you know, Kofi Annan was on, on the TV screens. Uh, he was on the pulpit, as we often call it, all the time. And he was always there to defend the ideals of the UN, the international law, the conventions, the peace efforts, protection of civilians, uh, development, uh, you know, millennium development goals, uh, as they were also called uh, later on. Um, That that is really his legacy. He, he, He represented international ideals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I know some people would deride him as a secular pope, but I found that to be a, a badge of honor. Uh, yeah, indeed. In, in many ways, uh, yes. Uh, I mean, he. Uh, to me, the UN has to be the, the the moral voice. It's there to uphold norms. Uh, there are 
too many uh, countries and too many leaders who are only there to uh, chauvinistically push for their own political interest or their very nationalistic interest. He 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 helped all of us uh, try to advance uh, what is good in the United Nations. Well, you know, speaking about individuals in the UN system who are upholding norms. I mean, you're out there every day trying to uphold uh, international humanitarian law and humanitarian norms in the devastation of the Syria conflict. Um, I know we are, are speaking at a rather critical moment in, in that conflict. Could you explain for listeners who, who are not aware what the significance of Idlib is in a potential battle over Idlib? Why are you so concerned right now? Well, Idlib is a very special place in Syria. It's the northwestern corner, corners up to uh, Turkey. And it is the place uh, that what has been held the longest from for uh, by armed opposition groups. Uh, it is still now held by these groups. It is the last uh, stronghold of uh, the armed opposition groups uh, that um, you know took up arms against what they saw as repression uh, from the uh, the government uh, now seven years ago. Uh, this is also the place to where very many people fled when other areas were retaken by the government. They fled from Aleppo. They fled from the outskirts of Damascus. They fled from the whole north and the west to uh, to this northwestern corner of uh, Idlib. It's also the place to where very many fighters and their families were sent uh, as part of so-called peace deals, reconciliation deals, they often uh, uh, called. I mean, those who didn't want to, to, to lay down their arms when an area was uh, was retaken or got a peace agreement, those left for Idlib. So it is, uh, it is now a place with nearly three million civilians. Half of them are internally displaced already. I mean, they are refugees within this uh, region. And then, of course, there are also tens of thousands of fighters. And and so because of the presence of these fighters, it could be considered a legitimate military target by the Syrian government and Russians that, that back them. Yet at the same time, it's my understanding that the Turkish government also has profound and significant equities in sort of defending Idlib from this kind of attack. Can you just sort of briefly explain kind of the, the geopolitics of uh, Idlib as well and, and the various interests that other governments and, and other interested parties are bringing into this, this potentially very volatile situation? Yeah, so Idlib is a microcosmos of all of the interests that external interest that has made the Syria war bigger than any other war in a generation. Uh, it's it's where you know various powers have fought each other, and they fought each other at no uh, you know regard to the expense of the civilian population. So so th these other powers would would fight each other to the last Syrian, if need be. Uh, in, in Idlib, there would be, uh, you know, dozens and dozens, uh, probably more than a hundred different armed opposition groups in several large umbrellas. Some have been supported by Western countries, some by Turkey, uh, and many by various Gulf uh, countries. On the government side, uh, the Russians and the Iranians, but also militias from I Iraq and elsewhere, have fought uh, on the Assad government side. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, th these are major forces that oppose each other. It, but you, when you say they are legitimate targets, well, uh, yes and no. I mean, there are certainly thousands of fighters who would belong to groups that have been, lab been labeled terrorists by the UN and by 
very many of the UN's member states. Uh, there are very many other fighters who would be in groups that have already entered, uh, you know, local peace deals elsewhere. And I cannot see how we would not want to end the battle for Idlib, not in a bloodbath of the very many uh, children, civilians, women, elderly, people who have nothing to do with the struggle, but that we would uh, want to end it by negotiations. So that's what really at stake now in Idlib. Do you, you know, on one hand, a bloodbath, on the other hand, you know, rational, diplomatically negotiated peace deals that will spare the civilian population. And uh, I, I would say uh, 98%, 99% of everybody there are civilians. Uh, I guess, why do you expect sort of the rational to take hold now uh, in a conflict in which the rational, you know, had, had not taken hold thus far? No, I mean, the, uh, of course, there has also been a certain rationality in, in, in some places. And um, ma many were surprised that the south of Syria would be uh, retaken by government forces so far, uh, so fast. I mean, the, the, the very first demonstrations in the so-called Arab Spring started in this city called Dara, which is in the south. So it pulls apart from, from Id Idlib, which is in the very north. Uh, but because there were also agreements next to fierce and ruthless fighting, um, the, 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 it, it wasn't as bad in Dara and Konetra in the south as it ended in a place called Eastern Ghouta, which is just east of um, Damascus, or in eastern Aleppo, or for that matter, in Raqqa, that was mm. leveled to the ground uh, because it was held by um, by Islamic uh, State fighters. So uh, on Eastern Ghouta, I mean, you helped negotiate the evacuation of families and fighters uh, who, you know, were, were were threatened basically with with extermination from Eastern Ghouta, and of course they they fled to Idlib. I guess at the time, did you not? expect or suspect that a kind of final battle in Idlib might be inevitable? Well, I I importantly, I uh, and the rest of the UN did not participate in the uh, okay. direct talks between the armed groups and the Russians uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the government of Syria on the other side. Those talks were direct. Um, huh. And I have several times criticized that there hasn't been more humanitarian uh, involvement uh, in these uh, agreements because then we would have secured better protection for civilians in these uh, talks. But indeed, th those those final agreements, for example, from this place called Duma, which was a, a rebel stronghold within Eastern Ghouta, ended by uh, fighters and the families being evacuated to Idlib, uh, and uh, and with that, in a way, also has made it, I think, incumbent on all of the diplomats and countries involved in Syria, including the Russians, to understand that they they basically made Idlib take a lot of uh, foreign fighters and others who are considered extremist or terrorist, uh, and and knowing that there are many, many more babies than terrorists in Italy, mm -hmm. that we need to we need to spare no effort in getting agreements. And that includes even with groups that may be considered terrorist. So you mentioned uh, earlier in a press conference, uh, I saw that you know, Idlib is, is essentially the largest concentration of displaced people in the world today. Um, could you explain what sort of humanitarian operations are ongoing? And, and can you talk through some of the logistics of the humanitarian operations you have ongoing in, in Idlib right now? Yeah, in, in Idlib is, is a place with uh, nearly one and a half million internally displaced people. 
internal refugees in a population of close to 3 million. So half of the population there are internally displaced. There are 150 uh, non-governmental organizations, humanitarian groups, 10 UN agencies are involved in a massive lifeline that gives virtually every single month uh, relief to 2 million of the 2.9 million people in in Idlib. Uh, These 150 or or more uh, non-governmental organizations and UN agencies have 12,000 humanitarian staff in Idlib. So there is actually a lot of very courageous and very successful humanitarian assistance in Syria. It's, it has been the largest operation possibly ever in terms of assistance in this war. Where we have failed is in protection. It's not assistance that is the, the main problem in, in Syria. It's protection. So you end up with this, uh, a little bit the situation that we did also have in uh, in the safe area of, of, of Bosnia, that you, you, you risk having the so-called well-fed dead. You know, we, we, we can provide uh, food to people, but we cannot protect them from, um, uh, from, from attacks, as is their right according to international law. And, 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 and that's my main concern now. The war will come to Idlib, and then it's not a question of more blankets or more food rations. It's a question of shielding people uh, from direct attacks. So uh, do you have any contingency plans um, to prevent, no, I suppose, in the in the event that you are, are unable to prevent this uh, all-out uh, attack on Idlib, what sort of contingency planning are you undertaking in order to at least mitigate the, the worst uh, outcome, the worst case scenario? We're doing a number of things. Uh, there is a um, there, there are several ser- scenarios developed uh, in terms of increasing the flow of of assistance. Uh, so that we cannot have people not having food and not having all, all the all of things that they do generally have at least a minimum of today in the event of increased war. So uh, there, there are contingency plans for actually. Uh, feeding and uh, sheltering hundreds of thousands or more people in in the worst scenarios. Then, of course, um, is protection-wise, we're also trying to, um, to do whatever we can to tell Russians and Iranians and Turks and Americans and others who have been blessed that they have to shield uh, people from uh, from attacks. Uh, there cannot be attacks on all of the places that we have. We're now trying to deconflict. Mm-hmm. What is deconfliction? It is basically that we give the coordinates of hospitals and uh, displacement camps and humanitarian offices, humanitarian warehouses to the air forces in, in the area. Uh, some uh, Some... You know, very well-meaning uh, solidarity groups say, are you crazy? You give coordinates to those who are bombing the place and they will now bomb these places. No, uh, deconfliction is the way we try to protect uh, places by telling the, 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 those air forces that we, we know now that they have gotten the coordinates and then we, we will hold them direct responsible for any attacks. And of those deconflicted places, very few have been um, hit. And if they are hit, as there's been in in some very few cases, we follow up as United Nations. May may I ask, you know, medical centers and and humanitarian um, targets have been bombed, like deliberately in in the course of of this war. Are NGOs fearful of giving or refusing to give their coordinates out of the expectation that that might in fact, lead them to be targeted? Yes, that's, the, that's uh. the problem. I mean, there is no trust, understandably so. Um, I think there are uh, several hundred, uh, five, six, seven hundred hum- uh, medical facilities that have been hit through this cruel war. That, that's, that's a number of places. Now, uh, w- we go then to the air forces, 
or, or even the ground forces who have uh, bombed the place or, or, or targeted the place and or thrown bombs there, uh, they would uh, say, no, no, we have hit no places that are, are humanitarian. These are places that have been contaminated by this or that armed group or this or that armed uh, actor. So it's it is um, it's been uh, horrible to see how uh, the medical profession uh, among the civilians have been particularly hard hit. And again, how do we end it? We end it by having these armed actors not uh, go uh, go after any place that have been deconflicted. If it's not deconflicted, they will always be able to say. Well, we we mm. we were targeted in a place where armed men were running towards, uh, and and to us it seemed like a, yeah. a, a, a military place. So, so you of course mentioned the need to um, prevent this this all out assault from happening in the first place. Who is are, are you the one doing the diplomacy behind the scenes, talking with the Russians, trying to facilitate to prevent this this outbreak? Is there any individual who is leading this effort to prevent this this assault from happening? Well, the the, the one individual which is in charge and works around the clock to to uh, advance the cause of peace and prevent uh, onslaughts like that is Stefan de Mistura, who is the special envoy. Uh, and, and, and mediator on behalf of the Secretary General of the United Nations. I advise him on humanitarian matters and I lead this humanitarian task force where Russia, Iran, the United States, Turkey, all of the P5 in the Security Council and, and, and all of the neighbors of Syria sit. And there we bring up any and all of these issues and there we discuss Idlib deconfliction, attacks on, on hospitals, how convoys have not been going uh, through, uh, have been pre- cruelly uh, pr- uh, you know, blocked from going to besieged areas. Besiegement as a uh, you know, strangulation of civilians uh, and starve, starve or surrender tactic, uh, how medical uh, medicines and so on have been offloaded from the convoys that in the end went to these areas in violation of humanitarian law completely and in uh, in, and in making it even uh, you know worse for the civilians all of these are, are, are brought up and sometimes we succeed to to do things better for people and and too many times we all have uh, we are paid um Finally, I wanted to get your reaction to a recent announcement by President Trump that the United States was going to suspend uh, payments and and funding for reconstruction in in, in Syria. I'm wondering, number one, does that affect your work? Number two, um, what effect might this have on um, sort of post-conflict reconstruction in, in Syria? Well, it is one of the big uh, and most contentious issues now. Uh, you know, who, who should rebuild which was torn down? Uh, the, the, the Western countries, it's, it's the U.S., it's, it's the European Union, and everybody say basically we, we're not going to we're not going to fund rebuilding of what the, the Russians and the Iranians with with the Assad government tore down. I mean, you break it, you own it, you rebuild. Uh, what the Russians and the uh, and the government and others say, well, if nobody rebuilds, how can you then expect millions of people to return uh, to their uh, to their homes? Uh, I, I am a humanitarian. I don't go into uh, the one side or the other on the issue of rebuilding. Or, or not, and who should pick up the, the big, big hundreds of billions of dollar bill. However, I would say that the civilians who have been the number one victims of the cruelty of the, of the armed actors and their sponsors from the beginning need help to rebuild what are schools and hospitals and electricity and uh, safe water supplies. 
supply and so on. And we will, as humanitarian actors, including my own group, Norwegian Refugee Council, we will stay and deliver for the civilians. We take no side in this cruel war. We're not pro-government or pro-opposition. We're pro-civilians. And they need help to rebuild. And they need help to, to do, for voluntary, safe, and protected return. Uh, so, so finally, you know, as you said earlier, this this could either be the last worst bloodbath of the war, or it could be the last great opportunity for the international community to avert a bloodbath. How will you know uh, whether or not the international community rises to to the challenge in this situation? What will indicate to you whether or not um, this this sort of a process of of diplomatic resolution of this particular uh, issue will be resolved positively. Well, the events on the ground. I mean, at at the moment, we have some kind of a airy quiet before the hurricane. It it's not going to be a storm. It's, it will be a hurricane. Uh, it is. Th there hasn't actually been an increase in air attack of late. It's it's actually lower now than it was at the beginning of the year. There is, however, an a massing of troops around Idlib from the government side, and there is a lot of uh, a lot of fortification being built now by uh, the armed opposition uh, groups. Uh, remember also there are twelve Turkish military observation points inside the opposition-held Idlib, just as the Russians and the Iranians are outside of it with with the Syrian government. So, so it has every uh, indication of being horrific if there is only war, but it has also all possibilities to end in some sanity this cruel war and that we need to avoid another Aleppo, Eastern Ghouta and Raqqa, which were devastated by, by uh, war. Um, it, the presence of terrorists is no excuse for attacking civilians, uh, just as armed groups have no right to blend into the civilian population as they are also doing. So we need to push on both sides for for a, for a peaceful negotiated end. Our interest is to help the civilians survive and get a new beginning uh, in this ancient civilization, which is uh, Syria. All right. Well, well, Mr. Eaglin, thank you so much for your time and for your work, uh, frankly, on, on behalf of all of us, on behalf of humanity. So, so thank you. I thank, thank you for having me. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Jan Eaglin. Uh, yeah, I, I, I hope this warning, his warnings are, are well heeded by the international community. This really does seem to be a extremely dire situation. And uh, the worst outcome is, and frankly, a, a plausible uh, outcome. And uh, I'm sure we'll all be following the events very closely. We'll see you next time. Bye.